Hi. Nice to uh, be here in front of the camera. Um, it would be lovely to be in Oxford and the actual conference, but this is this is something uh, special, I think. And I know that a lot of the talks have already gone up uh, in, uh, to public access, and I've seen lots of excitement on Twitter and other social media about dark archives. And uh, I have not seen any of the other presentations, but I'm sure that coming, I think I'm last of the keynotes. Uh, it's disadvantageous. I don't think there's probably anything much that I'm going to say that is revolutionary or uh, that exciting. Nevertheless, stay with me for the next 40 or so minutes for seeing and being seen digital manuscripts and their viewers. And um, I'd like to thank Stephen Pink for the invitation to talk to Dark Archives 2020. Um, my brief has been to think about the future of the archive and related research, uh, which has proven sort of incredibly difficult, I think perhaps because of the befuddlement and uh, confusion that COVID-19 has created um, uh, in me. And it certainly takes me four times longer than it used to, to think a thought um, and then days to be able to put that into articulable form, as you can tell already. So I'd like to acknowledge first um, those to whom I owe an incredible debt in terms of just regular conversations about manuscripts and manuscript studies. Uh, Andrew Prescott, Orietta Derold, and Benjamin Albritton, who's um, just general kinds of conversations and exchanges on email um, really make a difference to the way that I go about thinking about books and the digital realm, libraries, repositories. And I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, appalling state um, of large swathes of the world and the continued violence against black people, the persistent oppressions of minorities, the loss of life through the rampage of the COVID-19 virus, the incompetency of the UK and US governments, among others, the rise of fascism in America and elsewhere, and the bulging uncertainties that surround us now. Cheerful way to start, but all of this is relevant to our question at hand about the future of the archives. And it's relevant in a number of ways principally that the archive in its broadest sense um, as, the, as a place, real and abstract, where collective memory is gathered and from which history is written, has shown itself to be at the centre of society's efforts to create a record and hopefully a true record amidst a period of ferociously deliberate disinformation and secondly, for scholars, our dependence on libraries, manuscript repositories and archives has been underlined by the lockdown lacuna in access. And I was the first person, um, I wasn't the first person at all, I was the first researcher, I suppose, back into, uh, let back into Stanford's Green Libraries reading room in June, which has since opened and shut and opened depending on the virus's impact and the severity of the wildfires, polluted air in Palo Alto. And what seems so trivial in the light of world events, looking at something someone wrote for some reason 800 years ago, becomes so vital. That first day back in the library, looking at boxes of medieval charters from Norfolk, was joyful, exciting and focusing. I wore going out for dinner clothes, and a mask. And I looked at those charters and connected with a sharp commitment, the like of which I haven't felt since my encounter with the grandest of manuscripts I've worked alongside in years gone by. Now it's imperative then that this dependency that scholars and others have on libraries and archives is made explicit and particularly at this time. And it's imperative that the centrality of arts and humanities to living through the pandemic crisis is remembered. On social media, there's plenty of colleagues speaking and illustrating their pleasure at being back in the British Library reading room, or librarians showcasing their uh, exhibits or uh, showing us their labours to get their public spaces ready. But now is the time for academics and scholar citizens to let their local institutions know how important in-person provision has been shown to be, and to thank archives and libraries and all of those who work in them for the services that they've provided virtually. The online has been the lifeline. For those of us working on medieval manuscripts that are predominantly 
uh, in European repositories, whether archives or libraries, online access to holdings has been crucial for years. I want to stress that the distinction between the library and the archive um, as places, uh, though they often manifest in the same manner, as sites of different professional um, activities, as re repositories that usually hold such varying material gathered with radically different purposes, is so significant. So the differences are significant. Um, okay. Trying to move forward, moving forward. Um, these, are, these are some of the questions that, that one might ask. And I've just finished a course on uh, the human in the archives where we dealt a lot with special collections types of material and we dealt um, quite a lot with um, library materials, books and literary kinds of uh, documents and manuscripts. And these are some of the kinds of questions that sprung to mind about what are the distinctions between the two. I think those distinctions are really important. And Andrew Prescott uh, reminded me of this in an interview that he and I uh, recorded that's on the Text Technologies uh, new YouTube channel, or should be by the time that you're watching this. Dr. Meredith at Pew at the National Library of Wales also reminded his audience of the significance um, of the archival record for discoverability in contrast to the library, arc, uh, library record, which I'll show you in just a moment, in relation to the Penyarth manuscripts. So he gave us a tip about how to get into the um, archive record, which you can see in front of you here, and um, which gives you uh, different kinds of information uh, to the um, smart uh, interface that you would acquire if you come in through the library and look at the Penyarth manuscripts. And so this is an important point in the light of the dark archives, which as a catchy title, and it is a wonderful title, also flattens the meaning of archives. And for today, I'm gonna to try to use repositories when I mean library and archive, and I'm gonna use primary source when I mean manuscript and document. But as I say, these distinctions really are um, worth pursuing. So I'm hopeful though, and here's the crux, that the months long inaccessibility of primary sources caused by the pandemic will have one positive effect. And that is the recognition that it's acceptable to admit to using manuscripts only virtually. So many projects like Parker on the Web or Polonsky have not been given the full credit that they deserve in published scholarship as researchers elide the use they make of digital materials. The sort of, um, I have not seen it in person that occasionally appears in footnotes is an apology for incompleteness, but for much investigation that we do, the digital rendition of the source is more than adequate and it permits significantly different questions to be asked than the physical textual object itself does. The digital is though, as scholars have discussed widely in the last few years, not the manuscript. And I believe many are still coming to terms with this. And I'm going to stay with this uh, kind of area for a while, because as I hope I'm gonna make clear, there are consequences for the future of the archive in the way that we perceive, understand and display um, uh, the digital image. Now for this talk today, uh, Stephen and the organisers drew me back to the Dark Archives Conference in 2019, which is of course now a whole year, but also a whole world away. And I had responded on my blog, Text Technologies, to the stimulating discussions that took place at that conference. Uh, it was a session uh, over which Pip Wilcox chaired. It was, it was great. Um, my response on the blog for Text Technologies was organised around the letter A for archive. And I'm going to use that same set of foci today. Uh, though some of my thinking has changed dramatically, first as a result of finishing my monograph, The Phenomenal Book, um, it's on perceptions of medieval British manuscripts, and I hope it'll be out next year. Um, and second, uh, as a consequence of the inability, my inability to travel or visit any library other than my own Stanford campus library, which I've been to three times um, since March. Now, in considering the future of primary sources, abstractly conceived, my first A, um, organising under A, is for aspect. And this is to suggest a way forward for, for conceiving of our objects of study, digitized images of a manuscript. Now this has been a hot topic for 
debate in the last decade. I've written a piece on it and um, many, many scholars have written about the way that the digital image relates to the physical object. Um, I will try and put together a bibliography of these um, materials because they're really, it's a very interesting uh, subject to follow and it's quite scattered. There's lots of blogs, lots of social media posts, but also um, numerous articles and in fact, a good number of monographs and some really excellent ones coming out in the next year or two. So over the course of the last nine or 10 years, I've been all over the place in my thinking about how the digital object relates to the physical. But I think it's important to understand what it is that I'm looking at when I click on a repository link. And so here are some thoughts on what I am gonna call, henceforth, um, until I change my mind, the digital aspect. Now, in Dot Porter's article, uh, The Uncanny Valley and the Ghost in the Machine, a discussion of analogies for thinking about digital medieval manuscripts, which is on her um, dotporterdigital.org website, she plainly and rightly states, uh, the digitized manuscript is not the manuscript itself. Now, Dot thinks through the implications of the statement by considering a variety of analogies offered by, among other things, the language of transformative works, drawing parallels between the digital physical modes and the fan fiction canon texts, and by the ghost in the machine, which, as Dot explains, and I'm quoting, was a term coined by philosopher Gordon Ryle in 1949 to describe the concept of mind-body dualism. She analyzed this concept with uh, Walter Benjamin's aura, with Sean Eckhard's idea of spirit, and with Marshall McLuhan's dissociation of the medium and the message, or at least the separation of those two categories. And all three of these, plus um, Dot then and Gordon Ryle, compare these range of thoughts on mind body dualism to ask what is the ghost and what is the machine? So I'd like to investigate further the use of the Cartesian motif of mind body, as I don't find it a useful way to think about the digital, which is after all partly an extension of the physical. Now turning to a phenomenological conception of the world and the objects in it, um, perhaps as he does for the human experience broadly, Maurice Mello-Ponty, the French phenomenologist whose work I draw on in all of my research, seeks to explain how it is that we live in the world. Thousands of pages are required to explicate his theory and practice. And I want to focus on um, only one component, and that is how we perceive objects in the world and the world around us always perspectively and through motility, proprioception, kinesthetics, the movement of the body within the world. Now, some of you might have heard me talk about this before as I've worked my way through his oeuvre and his many books and articles really inform my understanding of um, a human's interaction with everything around them but particularly it's so significant for the hefty uh, artifact, the book. And I believe his work preempts triple O, object oriented ontology. It preempts thing theory. Um, and it also preempts many of the decade old uh, evaluations of the benefits of other or otherwise of the virtual world that we now occupy from the margins of the uh, computer on our desks so lengthily on any given day. Uh, for Merleau Ponty, and in my own dependent understanding, our basic knowledge of the world comes from our body's exploration of it, that is, our being in the world. That is to say, we move through the world with an embodied mind, and the embodied mind is the agent. The world and our consciousness are mutually dependent. The idea of seeing and being seen, which is the title of this paper, comes from the phenomenological understanding of habitual behaviours in the world. Merleau-Ponty comments, and I'm quoting, I perceive in a total way with my whole being. I grasp the unique structure of the thing, a unique way of being, which speaks to my senses all at once. He represents the synergistic relationship of body and world with the term inhabit. So he talks about um, 
object as inhabited objects. He talks about us as inhabiting um, objects around us. And this points to that which is already known by the body, translating into knowledge of how to interact with an object innately or pre-reflexively. So in other words, you know, if you're dancing, uh, you move your limbs in rhythm to the music, but you're not saying to your arm, um, uh, spring upwards at a 45 degree angle, uh, you can tell them from the 1980s, um, if I reach towards this glass of water, I'm not saying to my hand, you need to grasp a, a three inch glass and bring it to my mouth, which is situated just here. So it's a pre-reflexive kind of set of interactions with objects. So objects themselves are already inhabited by us, in effect. They offer us possibilities for action that we consider um, even as we apprehend that object. And I'm really happy to talk more about this in Q&A, although I suspect this is not the subject that will engage most people. Uh, in his discussion of objects in the world then, Merleau-Ponty stresses that we cannot reduce the world to components and that you can't further reduce individual objects to their separate parts. And that's really important for me in thinking about the book as a whole object, which is what uh, the phenomenal book, my monograph is all about. A physical book invites us to pick it up, to open the covers, move through it in a variety of directions. And we might think of some of these actions as codex, or codexical, intimate to the book. So codexical, intimate to the book. And the digital can allow us to perform codexicality in a digital repository or a Kindle ebook. That is, we can move through the folios in ways similar to the flexibility offered by the physical object itself. But the inhabiting of an object, the, um, the being lodged in it, if you like, means that we have a notion of what it might feel like or weigh. Um, and that's presented to us by the object itself in conversation with all other objects around us. You get a sense of the size of something partly by those things against which um, it is, it's situated. As Merleau-Ponty says, you can't reduce an object to its components. The parts of an object each contribute to the gestalt of the phenomenon. Now, if you can't reduce the object to its components, then what we see online is not, of course, the manuscript, as Dr. Porter and others point out. It's a representation of part of the object. And by being a representation of a part, it offers a mere perspective of the book unlike perceiving the book from an angle on a desk, for example, like the book image in front of you, which is uh, Oxford Bodleian Library, Bodley 343, uh, my own photograph. Um, and if you see it as, from an angle on a desk, what we're seeing uh, is also our own, uh, only our own perspective. It's a transcendental view. So this is a transcendental view, as Merleau-Ponty would have it, when we see the digital perspective, however, there is nothing behind that. So, you know, this image of the book that I took, you can see the shelves or box shelves behind it. You can see the light to the right. Um, you can anticipate me in specific relation to this book and slightly duck down with my camera, taking the picture of these kind of lively dynamic um, folios. Uh, so I think you get that sense of it. And that's as opposed to a, a digital image where, um, there's nothing behind it. It's a flat, it looks like a flat um, perspectival top down view. There's no wholeness with regard to the original physical object in a digital image. And this creates a major disjuncture phenomenologically. There's an expectation of a particular kind of interaction. There's an invitation from the book, which we, we always have when we see the book, right? It says, turn my pages, open me whatever. Um, but that interaction is either simulated through software digitally and or the image does not exist in a meaningfully embodied way. <clears throat> so um, relatedly, research that's just come out actually in the last sort of few months in relation to the chrono zoom, the zoom era, era shows that the reason zoom is so exhausting is because it lacks the being in the world phenomenological significance that Merleau-Ponty elucidates in relation to all objects. Um, this is an example of <clears throat> one of those pieces of um, pop research. So, and I mean, that is not what the article, uh, what the writer of the article says. This is not, the, this person here is not talking about um, Merleau-Ponty and phenomenology, but they are talking about the fact that your body cannot 
process what they see with zoom your eyes and your ears um take on the entire kind of responsibility if you like of the in-person meeting and that's why it's exhausting our already ocular centric world our sort of visually obsessed world is dramatically more ocular centric uh, as a result of uh, the, the digital phenomenon hearing and sight are fully occupied other senses are static the fleshiness of the panorama of a sort of everyday in-person situation is lost and this is how the digital aspect works and if i'm right about this then it's futile and so i suppose i'm getting to the point of my first point which is about digital aspect it's futile for us to continue pursuing emulative technologies that seek to replicate the book the turn the pages the three-dimensional um whatever we're coming up with time after time as bolt-ons to triple if or, or whatever however these tools are being developed it's kind of pointless because the digital aspect is not ever going to be phenomenologically replete um, and instead the get it digitized and get it up there kind of a practicality of pressured digital programs is the right way forward as opposed to being sidetracked by uh, projects that seek to, to think more about the browser interface and in that sense the rapid publishing of digitized images of manuscripts is the best possible result um, at present even when what's available in time and resource human resources only partial so um, you know in the Bodleian there are many many manuscripts available on their digital Bodleian website but so many of them like this one only have you know two, one two or three or four images you can't see the whole thing but that is uh, most definitely uh, better than nothing and it's where energies might lie is what is what I'm saying so perhaps most significantly too um, the way most digital images function is through a realization that does not physically exist uh, and that is through the page you see here the page um, they call it so it's folio 147 verso but they're showing it us as um, a verso of a complete object in the real world which is the verso or the recto verso uh, of the folio now i talked about the page um, as, a, as a non-existent unit, uh, phenomenologically, eight years ago, or something like that, in a lecture, delivered to the Institute of Historical Research, and it riled, I think it really riled, a number of good friends in the field. Uh, I denied the validity of the page as a unit of investigation beyond its use for enumeration. So it's simply a pragmatic unit. Uh, and enumeration, of course, itself is an abstract concept and in the context of the physical book a page is only one side of the thing um, i'm going to go back to bodily 343 so you can really see what i'm talking about so the page is only one side of the thing the, ob the object which is the folio um, and in the operation of the book the page is only ever one of a mutually con constitutive pair the verso recto the opening um, or the recto verso the folio the page does not exist as a singular unit so to expect the digital realm the aspect to be an honest representation is illusory which is why i believe further that 3d imaging or turning the pages or any other kind of emulative sedimentary mode of display will miss the point of the differentness of the digital aspect so in my proposal for the utilization of the term digital aspect to label the online focus of display i incorporate the idea of a perspective an acknowledgement that the view is limited even while the capabilities for what scholars can do uh, is not and for merleau ponty i suspect he might have thought of the online book either as an illusion which he labels an incorrect experience or more probably with a huge optimism that the aspect the digital aspect represents the imagined but I'd like to move us away from the idea of the digital as a secondary manifestation of the physical and uh, such a move allows us to provide the digital aspect with status and an appreciation of the merits of what's provided in digital repositories in and of itself. We need then to break away completely from the fixedness of the book, um, of the book form and recognize the potential of this new mode of data provision. I think as long as we kind of try to emulate or be skeuomorphic in what we rep in how we try to represent the digital aspect the less successful 
we are likely to be. So free the digital aspect um, to be the abundant mode of information provision that it is. And talking about abundance, what would be provided by this sort of freeing is uh, cognizance of the superabundance of the uh, digital record. Arlette Farge in the Allure of the Archive speaks eloquently of the abundance of the archive uh, and where she's specifically referring to documents generated by government sponsored organizations like the 18th century police force, uh, French police force that she's dealing with. And she tells us, and I quote, the words copied down by the clerk might give the impression that it's possible to know everything, but this is an illusion. The seeming limitlessness of the words does not entail a similar limitlessness of information. Rather, the abundance itself should convince the historian that the accumulated clues leave so much unsaid and cause her to recognise that she is only barely capable of perceiving the reasoning of the individuals she finds immobilised in and by these documents. Now, this abundance has an obvious effect on providers and users. Uh, in the case of projects like Parker uh, 2 or the Polonsky project at the British Library in Bayonet, Funding demands the calculation of the digitizing and digital presentation of images and a semblance of completeness in the task. Polonsky reveals that it funded the digitization of 800 manuscripts, as you can see here. And the number 800 is repeated effectively four times on the landing page and is uh, boxed in, uh, as you can see here in this uh, framing. It's boxed in in the uh, display on the blog page clearly signifying effort, value and potential through enumeration and this idea of some form of completeness, massiveness, effort. At the Vatican Library, um, the incredible DigiVatLib, Digital Vatican Library project, uh, presents its numbers digitised on the home page in an information display. It's a little bit like how many spaces are left in the car park. New digitised manuscripts, 234 up to June this year. Um, which I sincerely congratulate them on that quarterly report, uh, given what everyone was going through in, from April to June in 2020. And the number of added images was 78,559. So the emphasis on the numerical achievement of processing gives us a number of opportunities to reflect upon the current status of e-material manuscript studies. At 10 years old, this project at the Vatican has an astonishing 80,000 manuscripts in its purview. Uh, yielding a mind-boggling 40 million individual images, 40 million. In the collaboration with the Bodleian Library, the Vatican's Polonsky project has already made 1.5 million images available, primarily focused on Greek and Hebrew manuscripts and in Cunabula. Now these numbers are staggering, uh, a little overwhelming, okay, a lot overwhelming, and especially so when I when, as I do, the scholar tries to get to grips with their research, where does one start is often hard enough. But now, more to the point, where does one end? Moreover, abundance for one person is not so for another. And this in part hinges on priorities and agenda. While Western manuscripts are available in vast numbers, and that includes Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, non-Western books and documents are far less accessible. And this is an increasingly serious issue, which may call for a deliberate redirection of resources in both library repositories and archives. And non-Western here also includes the textual objects of indigenous, Aboriginal, native and colonized peoples all over the world. Uh, if you go onto the uh, online California archive, uh, the online archive of California and you type in uh, Native American, it takes you to really the most extraordinary uh, extraordinarily unrelated set of documents and that is profoundly troubling and is as much to do with uh, discoverability, tagging and the search function um, as the fact that so many records are, are just not available um, in, in the public domain. Um, and a, a, a much more simple example is the display of a manuscript collected by John Greaves, the 17th century antiquarian and manuscript collector uh, upon whom a Stanford student, uh, Pfizer Parviz, is working. Now, Pfizer knows that I'm talking to you about her work just very briefly. Uh, it's, amaz it's amazing work and it's particularly poignant 
that she's working on the 15th century scientist Ulug Beg and his star catalogues, uh, the Zijil Sultani, this year of all years, because she had been planning to spend a summer looking at the manuscripts in the United Kingdom. And instead, she has access to only individual openings of manuscripts wrongly uh, catalogued as written in Arabic. Uh, this is a Persian, she has identified it as a Persian manuscript, but it's catalogued as Arabic. Now we could all agree, I think, that even a single digital aspect, which is what this is, is better than nothing at all, but scholars working on non-Western materials often face a battle to find any of the materials they require. So abundance is a variable mediated by long-standing scholarly agenda. An abundance motivating the production of digital images of manuscripts also results in uncatalogued, uh, or at least contextless materials being made accessible. So the speed of digitization means uh, for many repositories, they're putting things up without the concomitant ability to catalogue. And I think, you know, we're increasingly relying on crowdsourcing or um, individual funded projects to take on small parts of large um, archives or uh, library repositories in order to populate um, the data for these um, individual objects. So an example uh, here, um, Ben Albritton and I have discussed the merits of this approach of rapid digitization without the uh, um, simultaneous provision of cataloging material or metadata. And if you look at this manuscript at the Vatican Library, it's Vatican um, Ind 71, so from the South Asian uh, subcontinent. What I'm showing you on that page is all that is available about this folded accordion style book. Um, there's no interpretative framework. Um, I do not know, I'm very sorry to say, I do not know what language this is written in and the way that it's digitized is as if it were note page upon page, whereas in fact of course it's a single long um, object, a textual artifact. Is it better that it's like this without an interpretative framework? Because now it's accessible to all the teams or would it be better to provide some form of cataloging before uh, making the object uh, publicly available? I think it's really important to fill in the absences in the record and so um, as say Ben and I were talking about this, what the Vatican is doing is really significant and groups are already working on, groups of scholars are already working on this kind of material, but who has the responsibility for this material once it's published? And how do I, as a jobbing scholar, uh, keep up with what's going on with projects around the world who may or may not be working to explicate otherwise contextlessness, contextless digital objects? And if I may just pause there to ask my colleagues, those of you who have are staying with me thus far, to ask um, what about the current obsession with fragments, of which there are tens of thousands? Um, I, wonder, I wonder why there's such an obsession with fragments when there are so many complete, if you like, ob larger textual objects to be worked on. What is the obsession with fragments? Is it something to do with control? Do we, do we feel like we can somehow control that corpus more? Or, is it to do with manageability or scale? It's easier to identify, transcribe, label, catalogue um, a fragment than it is um, an entire uh, codex or uh, part of a codex. Um, is it about the accumulation of knowledge through small nuggets of information that, that kind of build up to something uh, more significant? This idea of accumulation then um, is also important because in a period of text technological transformation like the very era that we're, that we're in, uh, patterns from the past demonstrate there is always a relative explosion um, of data, of information, and particularly at a time of crisis. And so this was true at the emergence of print, both in China and in the West later. And it's true at the point of mechanization in the later 18th and early 19th centuries. And concomitant with this effort, um, with this um, uh, accumulation and uh, acceleration of text technologies, um, are efforts to control for groups or individuals to seek to assert authority um, for claims of the erasure of truth because you can't uh, kind of manage or uh, contain within your mind the amount of information that's suddenly being uh, provided and so forth. 
So as data increases exponentially, one could argue knowledge or proportional knowledge um, decreases. So things that we thought we knew, uh, we now realize that we simply don't. And indeed the speed of digitization or information provision runs counter to the speed of scholarly investigation. So the more that we put online, the, in a sense, the slower we will be in processing it. Um, that's one scenario. The other scenario is that scholarship does not increase in terms of its speed simply because there is more information for scholars to work with. Um, in my blog last year of the uh, A's that came out of the Dark Archives One conference, I declaimed that we're at a period where a moment of stasis, a point beyond which it's impossible to move. But I think in the light of the pandemic and everything else that's happened in the intervening year, this was the wrong conclusion to draw. Instead, what I see happening is an acceleration, both in terms of what becomes available, and I hope with a focus on less well-known parts of our archives and libraries, and in terms of the impulse for significant revision, not necessarily wholesale discovery, especially in the Western corpus, or massive originality, but certainly knowledge revision. And um, knowledge revision will come about, I think, in an accelerated form. And that's in running in parallel with the acceleration of the provision of information of data through digitization. So hundreds of thousands of digital aspects of medieval books and documents are now visible to a wide audience and possibly an audience that is able to scrutinize deeply in a way that has not been viable before. These manuscripts principal revelation is to counter accepted truths of scholarship that are decades old and accelerate the revision of accepted knowledge. So it's now just a button click away to look at the features described as diagnostic in books and articles dating from as far back as Maund Thompson or E.A. Lowe one can at the press of a button see that the features identified as key by these scholars who set the foundations for the field are perhaps less significant or more widespread than these scholars were able to detect from their in-person only visits to repositories with even then limited access. In one case, and I shan't name the author since it seems invidious to delight in proving earlier scholars wrong when they simply didn't have the research materials at their disposal that I do. In this case then it appeared to this author that the initial with a ball-like decoration and aligned vertical strokes as you can see on this capital uh, decorated capital N uh, was exclusively the type of initial that one would find in Worcester. Because we can now whiz through manuscripts like Cambridge Trinity College B431. This feature of the ball on the limb with the vertical aligned strokes is clearly not simply a, a Worcester criterion. And you can tell, you know, one can tell that because of the amount of information that's available to us at the click of a button. Similarly, categories of organization and chronology, script in particular, that have um, also been used to higher archives to create sets of those textual objects that we privilege as aesthetically remarkable are now open to question. And I'll just give you one example, which is an undigitized charter from Stanford University Library. It's uh, the Flawden charters, which date from the uh, very late 12th century into the 16th century, actually. And this is charter 23 in box M556, dated to 1402. Our ability to see in these objects, and especially uh, through the vast array of uh, online materials, you're able to see that categories that exist to help us organize information are actually much shakier than one might imagine. So in this rather lovely charter, um, just the, there's a kind of uh, add mixture of hands that are sim sim simultaneously sort of a texture hand and a documentaria hand. Um, and of course, the context is, is diplomatic. So if you whiz along the top line to what's quite interesting is to see the mixture of letter forms, you whiz it across the top line um, to the uh, penul um, penultimate word, uh, tea burrow. you see the use of yog um, in this otherwise almost exclusively Latin manuscript. There is a thorn in there, uh, leave you to find that. 
so the sort of straightforwardness of categories the certainty of scry of um, paleographers codicologists 50 uh, 30 50 70 100 years ago when the field was founded um, are i think going to be increasingly in need of revision as a result of that which is at our fingertips now we just the sheer amount of images and um whole book equivalent uh, aspects that we're able to see um it's a quick example too that i just sent to Matteo, uh, who's um, working on 13th century manuscripts he's really interested in uh, looped d and you can see it kind of forming in this otherwise fairly formal sort of book hand in a manuscript that is uh, has a uh, um, high grade script elsewhere in it you can see how this uh, d that becomes commonly associated with anglicana um, forms out of this scribe's work so seeing the digital aspect of all of these folios um, being able to zoom in to catch the detail uh, which is often just a um, actual hair stroke of a quill pen is going to allow us to revise received scholarship. So contemporary and future scholarship, I think, in the archive, abstractly conceived, will make accelerated and co corrective strides and privileged by easy access to that which was previously difficult to see and scholars working either with individual plates and collections or from photographs, scholars working with microform or from published facsimiles, scholars who had limited time with the physical primary sources at libraries that rightly shut for lunch times. These scholars, 30, 50, 70 years ago, were remarkable in their seeking to organise, to categorise, to classify and to control the information upon which they worked. Whereas we are able at the fortuitous click of a link to show that their findings were not quite right. And we should do this with appreciation and grace, I think, both in both appreciation and grace in short supply in some areas of our profession and nowhere more so than in medieval studies. And uh, I did a mise en page uh, seminar for the Bibliographical Society of America, was able to work in this way with prickings in margins of manuscripts across a wide uh, chronology to discover that standard works on pricking are in need of revision now that we can do work so easily um, at the click of a button like this. Um, so this acceleration, I think, will change the dynamics of scholarship as we understand it. And this is already well underway. And not only will collaboration be absolute gold standard, since no one individual can manifest all the skills required for work that is both historical, uh, phil philological, paleographical, codicological, codic literary, and technical, analytical, inductive and deductive. No one can do all of those things all, all at once, but there is also no excuse for not collaborating in days that have shown us how intellectually liberating it is to participate in free and open access to scholarly debate. Collaboration might allow us to slow the pace a little, even as computational tools allow us to see at scale what we uh, did not know existed. Uh, collaboration also demands acknowledgement, as I said in my blog last year, and a keen awareness of the shared endeavour. And instead, what I hear more of in various circles are claims of plagiarism or some or other scholarly inadequacy. So free and open scholarship is generous but appreciated, appreciative. And in this spirit, where I had previously stood and said, oh, I think libraries should do this, or I think libraries should do that. Why isn't there standardised metadata? I think the last few months have shown us um, and especially the free and easy access to conferences online is the need for me um, as representative of, um, I don't know what, myself. Um, it's a good idea for us to contribute what we can, uh, where we can, and I aim to make my scholarship as accessible as possible. So the digital aspect then allows scholars to see what they never could see previously, changes the shape of things, patterns emerge, as we can see from the gallery views at uh, Trinity College, my favourite website, as many of you know. They allow us new insights into manuscript production at the level of entire sequences of images, just extraordinary kind of geometries of uh, landscape, page landscape. Um, they also allow us to see the looped D uh, in that hand that I just showed you and the choices the viewers 
which represents just remarkable freedom, really. But real freedom will come from my penultimate pair of A's, and that is artificial intelligence and augmented realities. And I think the real shift in how we understand um, the digital will come in augmented reality, but artificial intelligence will allow us to provide speed to our work or a fresh pair of eyes um, in a way that, that will parallel with the rapidity of the provision of information that comes from digitization. And at Stanford, um, in terms of artificial intelligence and augmented realities, as in so many other uh, places, so many other teams of scholars um, around the world, you know, we've got projects like um, cyber text technologies, which, um, as you can see from our codex database, is a global um, computationally assisted project to discern patterns in the production and life cycles of all information technologies from pre-cuneiform tablet technologies to technologies that have not yet been invented. So working with a very large team of scholars and uh, having um, a highly curated data set like this, but also uncurated data sets that come from the uh, British Museum, from the Met, from the Walters Art Gallery and elsewhere that contain textual objects. Um, we have been able to run algorithmically complex analyses of vast bodies of information to think about the ways that manuscripts or tablets or um, printed books or um, digital technology, technological devices, how they function through their life cycles, what their biographies are like, what patterns emerge that we can use to detect how these uh, devices and their um, uh, texts that they contain, how they are produced, disseminated and consumed. And the team includes uh, Mateusz Wafinski, Dr. Mateusz Wafinski at uh, Freie Universität in Berlin, who um, is our computational whiz along with Claire Tandy. And so AI, I think, and machine learning more broadly is likely to provide us with the speed and this extra pair of eyes to allow us to analyze the information that is being um, churned out at such a rate. Um, we're able to see where there are, I suppose, like danger spots for um, the cycles of information technologies. And in this case, um, it's to do with uh, the way that, that um, objects cease to be useful to us when they become um, less flexible for want of a better word, less flexible or less usable. Um, so cybertext is just, if you're interested in it, um, there's the, the link, but we have a white paper that we've just finished, which is about 30 pages long, outlining our methodology and the uh, results of our inductive research before we move to the deductive phase. And if you're interested in seeing the white paper, let me know and I will happily share it with you so you can comment on it. Other projects include one that I've talked about before, Global Currents, where we have sought to use um, machine learning to extract features of manuscripts through providing trained data like this to the team in Montreal, to uh, Professor Mohamed Sheriat's team of com uh, computer scientists. And they returned us thousands and thousands of uh, images which have allowed us to um, create density maps of where, for example, you're likely to find literary bibliores or in large capitals on manuscript folios, or to look at our glorious uh, image galleries, which are highly selective. Um, they doesn't include all of the data that we have, but all of the data is stored at the Stanford Digital Repository. Um, and we've already begun to make um, some really interesting discoveries from looking at uh, rubrics, enlarged initials, uh, into textual space uh, and so on. So it's a, it's a very exciting project. And I think that it's with computational learning that we'll be able to um, move really quickly through vast swathes of uh, online materials. So artificial intelligence and augmented reality is really very significant indeed. And my final pair of A's then, 
uh, as I get through these images, are that we look at artificial intelligence, we think about digital aspect, but basically we attend to the next generation and to be, we ask questions of all that has proceeded. In talking to my 20 year old daughter about digital tools and methods, um, she's uh, been working on some uh, personal archives for me this summer. She is not really that interested in seeing original objects. She thinks digital access, she's not a medievalist, but she thinks digital access is where the future lies. So you preserve and you conserve these things and people like you, mum, she said, so scholars um, can go and look at these materials that most people wouldn't be interested. They just want to have a look at it online. And so attending to our next generation and making sure that the way that they see the world is represented in the way that we represent the world, I think is really critical. But in scholarly terms, providing training materials that is free and open access, non-competitive, I think is really critical. And I think moving away from fancy add-ons to technology, so technological whizzes and bangs are great, but really, um, looking at the information that's already there and recognizing its difference from the physical object. Since scholarship can't keep up with the fancy stuff anyway, is probably crit critical. And we're at a fold in time, uh, a spot where training is so essential, freely given, openly accepted. Um, but it's also a spot where questioning of established scholarship, replete with its hierarchies that we've rehearsed at length in the last few years, is really essential, challenging established hierarchies and questioning all that's preceded. Questioning does not mean rejecting or mocking or ignoring. That happens already every day. Questioning means kind acknowledgement and a constant eye on our adaptation of existing ideas. Is it so shocking to suggest that women scribes might be the first we think of when we ponder who wrote something in the medieval period? Is it so terrible to be audacious in our efforts to further scholarship? to speculate um, in the hope that that will stimulate discussion? Is it unacceptable to suggest that received modes of understanding manuscript production now seriously require uh, rethinking? So rethink received modes of understanding manuscript production based on the vast abundance of information available to those with the ability to connect. The future I envisage and would like to be part of brings scholars together not pushes them apart and it appreciates that most of us are good intentioned and want to make a contribution that's positive even if that can sometimes be a little cack-handed snobbery and elitism have no role in this future collaboration i must do so shared understanding of scholarly goals shared endeavors can surely go some way to creating a more accepting dark archives more accessible resources a more agreeable set of professions for our young colleagues, not too much to ask. Thank you.